Thank you very much. Um, so thank you to Melanie and to all the Northern Rail Farming Conference team as well for providing this platform and giving us um, the space to, to share a bit more about what we are doing and, and how we're engaging more communities in a better grain and, blur, and bread and flour system as well. Um, so first of all, just introduce myself. I'm Lindsay. I'm the project coordinator at Scotland the Bread, and I'm sort of working with um, a lot of partner communities to empower local people um, to participate in, as I say, a, a better flour and bread system. And our work overall at Scotland the Bread is based on a collaborative approach. Um, we're delighted, therefore, to have um, joining to us tonight um, a lot of our partners, and I'll just let them introduce themselves just now as well. So, Daisy, do you want to start? Hi, uh, thanks, Lindsay. I'm Daisy, and I'm part of a research project, which is a collaboration between Edinburgh University, um, where I'm based, and Scotland the Bread. And we're looking at how grain and flour and bread supply chains can nourish people and nourish jobs. Uh, so I'll say more about that later on. Thanks for having me. Great. Um, Tara, would you like to go next? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm a crop scientist at the University of Edinburgh. I'm just coming to the end of a, my PhD. And in terms of my academic research, I focus on crop management practices for which involve mechanical stress. So things like spring rolling and harrowing for cereal crops. But that's not what I'm going to talk about today. Um, because last year I did a placement with Nourish Scotland and with Scotland Bread, looking at local grain networks and how to engage more people with local grain. And since then I've been helping um, with the citizen science aspect of the soil to slice project at Scotland the Bread, which I'm sure Lindsay's going to talk more about. Um, and also taking part in that, growing some small trial plots of heritage grains. Thanks. Uh, Sam? Hello, uh, thank you, Lindsay. I'm Sam Parsons. I manage the Falkowski estate for the Anstruther family in the East Nuke of Fife. Uh, we became involved in this in 2017 when we started growing heritage grains, uh, milling wheat uh, and rye uh, as an experiment. And we are still learning along the way. We are aiming to move away from large commodity crops and more towards specific uh, focus on end users uh, and also learn about how these heritage crops or certainly how the tools trawled uh, traditional crops rather than the modern varieties actually benefit soils and soil health. Great. And uh, Philip as well. Yeah, I, I'm Philip Revel. I'm from a community group called Sustaining Dunbar. Uh, and I'm just going to be talking briefly about uh, our involvement with, with the Soil to Slice project uh, and specifically what we call our Dunbar patchwork wheat farm. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, so, oh. First, there we go. Um, so first of all, I'm just going to give a brief overview of Scotland the Bread and the work that we do. Um, our aim, our ultimate aim really is to create a more healthy, sustainable and equitable and locally controlled flour and bread supply. And we're doing that by working alongside farmers, scientists, millers, bakers and citizens, just like those that, um, that are joining us today. Our work began in um, 2012, and that was, you know, beginning really with an extensive research into different varieties of grain, you know, moving away from a lot of the modern varieties that are grown nowadays, as we were really looking for, for different varieties, which, you know, were um, a lot more nutritious, they had a lot more vitamins and minerals in them than these modern varieties. Those that are more suitable for being grown in the, um, Scottish climate, you know, we're based in the East Newcombe Fife, so it's important that they are um, resilient and able to grow that um, in that environment. And also those that are able to be grown in an agroecological farming system, because that was certainly a priority of ours as well. We're looking for varieties or for a diversity of varieties to be grown together to avoid the issues that happen with monocultures. Um, and also very much importantly, um, those that have an exceptional flavour as well. Um, to appeal to a lot of the, the bakers and to the end, um, the, the eaters that are going to be eating the bread that's made from them as well. 
So with the help of uh, researchers and farmers, there's three varieties that were um, grown in Scotland in the 19th century that we then uh, managed to source from gene banks across the world. Um, we germinated them and they were grown out on farms across Scotland as well. They were first grown separately, um, but now what we're doing is we're growing them all together um, to create the Balkaski land race, which is harnessing the adaptive power of um, the natural selection in, in one particular area, and that is, of course, the Balkaski estate in Fife, where they're grown. Um, this is all to, to improve the resilience of the crop as well. We're also growing some evolutionary populations, which um, on the whole come from sort of Sweden and Nordic countries, and that's to really sort of bring up the level and enhance the bread making quality of the, the eventual flour that um, we're producing, and again to increase the diversity of the crops that we're growing. We are ultimately we're growing um, organically, and uh, Sam is going to speak a bit more about that and how we're growing it in that system later. But really, that's um, you know because among the many benefits of organic growing and organic farming systems, there's the general improvement for wildlife, um, which connects very much to our passion for increasing biodiversity. So as I say, I'll let Sam speak a bit more about that later. So having selected for um, much more nutritious grains, and you know, particularly for that nutrition, um, we're wanting to make sure that we're milling things in a way that um, doesn't remove all of those, uh, all of the bran and all the more nutritious um, parts of the grain. So oh, apologies, I didn't skip onto that one. Um, so here you can see our Zentrofan cyclone mill and our millers beside it. Um, we have two of these mills now and We've chosen them for, for several reasons. Um, unlike uh, the sort of industrial roller mills that are traditionally used, um, which can waste about 25% of the grain, or stone mills, which tend to heat the flour as well, these Zentrofan cyclone mills produce um, a really cool and ultra fine wholemeal flours. It basically um, is a volcanic rock with a hole in the middle. And so the grain comes down from the hopper, it fills, um, falls into this volcanic rock and a fan um, blows air up from the bottom and creates a cyclone. So the grain grains itself against this, this volcanic stone um, until it's light enough to then come out of the mill as this, as I say, ultra fine flour. And that of course, we managed to, that way we managed to retain the bran as well, which grains itself, finishing with a flour which doesn't have quite as large flakes of bran, as you might find with a lot of homeo flowers uh, traditionally. It's a low energy, um, an intermediate scale technology, which is a really good tool for decentralizing grain systems. Um, and that also obviously brings with it improvements in sort of food sovereignty and an ability to reduce the food miles of this product. We are, um, for example, we are based um, our mill is based on the farm um, at, at the Balkaski estate. So, you know, we are in that way able to create a sort of local food system. Um, and this is important to build connections between the farmer, such as Sam, um, our millers, and then the bakers that we then sell our flour on to as well. We've got, you know, we are able to, to sell locally and have that connection with those who are using the flour. Um, this provides opportunities for sharing expertise and learning and strengthening the, the overall system and the local grain community. The overall aim of Scotland the Bread, therefore, is not to purchase more mills and grow in size, really. Um, rather, we're trying to serve as a proof of concept for um, a more locally based grain system in Scotland. And to this end, we've developed a number of projects. Um, which are aiming really to engage people at a local level and strengthen their skills to grow grain and bake um, bake with these more local grains as well. So the first of these projects is Soil to Slice, which you can see in the top right hand corner. And um, that's been running since 2015 and it involves communities and learning to grow, thresh, um, mill and bake with the, these more nutritious grains in their own area. At Scotland the Bread, we're providing the seed, we're providing ongoing support um, and also access to small scale sort of processing equipment and also a sort of forum of all the other community growers so that people can share, share their learning, share their experiences, ask questions amongst each other. Um, this year um, and also sort of the previous year, 
that been a little bit more difficult to have the uh, learning opportunities that we'd hope to in person, obviously because of coronavirus and the lockdown. So we have managed to have a couple of sort of online sessions with Tara um, for people to share their experiences, to talk about different aspects of the project um, and to learn different things together. Um, we also managed to have an in-person meeting um, at Bow House in August, uh, again, sort of talking about different aspects of harvest and how, how we can celebrate that in our communities as well. Um, the project is an example of citizen science. We're providing some guidance um, and tools for these communities to measure their own crops. And all of that involvement and the data that they provide will bring a sort of more democratic aspect to our own wider crop research at Scotland the Bread. Our second project is Flower to the People, um, which came about as a response to the empty shelves um, that had no flour, no bread during the sort of initial lockdown last year. Um, the aim of the project really is to provide those communities with fewer resources, um, access to this more nutritious flour, and also the skills and the knowledge that they need to transform it into sort of delicious, nutritious bread that they can share with their, their families and their communities as well. We did this by um, sort of sharing a bread making demonstration. Again, the lockdown and, and all of those regulations did make it quite difficult for us to hold any in-person events as we'd hoped. Um, but we managed to share a demonstration. We had a sort of Zoom Q&A with the bakers so that people could um, tell us about the uh, bread making adventures they'd had, um, trying to use the recipes from the demonstration and get their questions answered as well. Um, we provided a, a pack for them all to use, which contained the flour and the recipes. And overall, you know, there was a really quite overwhelmingly positive result. A lot of the community food hubs that we partnered with in order to, to reach a lot of these people um, have continued to use our flour in their sort of regular activities, such as community meals, or they've started their own new activities, such as um, baking fresh bread to put in a community pantry or um, beginning sort of bread clubs where they can keep baking on a regular basis with, with people in the community and keep that enthusiasm and the learning um, of these skills going. So these projects really were, they're aiming to um, inspire, support, equip a lot of local people to, to participate at, at their local level. Um, in becoming active food citizens and engaging them in the movement um, and sort of welcoming them into this network of, you know, of, of many different people from many different backgrounds uh, who are all really working towards this um, better flour and bread supply in Scotland. Um, I've got a number of ideas here, you know, if you're really interested to get involved yourself. Um, Bake using local grains if you make your own bread. There's so many um, amazing um, locally produced breads and uh, grains and flours. I mean, in Scotland, you know, there's ourselves and Mungo's Wells who are quite well known and quite widely available as well. But I think there are quite a lot of smaller mills um, who are really growing and, and milling and selling on that local level. So it's really inspiring to hear about them and hopefully you can find them and, and use them in your own bread if you're making it. Uh, you, also, if you don't, Bake bread, then finding that real bread baker locally um, and supporting them is a fantastic idea. And, you know, obviously we've got our community projects running in Scotland. I know there's similar um, a similar project to Soil to Slice in, a, in different parts of the UK as well. Um, so do sort of have a look and see how you can get your community involved in as well, if you're interested in that. So I've also got my contact details up there and our details too, if you're interested in keeping updated with our work too. Um, I'll pass now on to our next speaker, um, and that's Sam, who's uh, representing a key partnership, obviously, for Scotland the Bread, as they're in charge of growing our own grains. Um, he's going to tell us a bit about his experience of doing so and what others in the farming community should be aware of if that's something they're interested in. So, Sam. Thanks very much, Lindsay. Um, we got involved in this, I think, as I said, in 2017 as a, as a means to looking at ways out of growing conventional arable crops, which predominantly went into producing alcohol in Scotland anyway. Um, there was very little connection between the grower and the consumer. So our, our customer effectively were 
big distilleries and looking at the way that the world was heading we felt that was a pretty risky place to be um and so when we started our organic uh, conversion of the whole farm back in 2016 we were starting to look at what we were going to do with the the land of the facility that was built um in our organic system and it seemed ridiculous to put it into alcohol we really should just be putting it into human food rather than cattle feed uh, and alcohol so we started this process off really needing help we weren't well equipped to know the markets we we didn't know how to grow it because you know, this is a very different farming system and from my perspective in particular going into a venture like this uh, without expertise was pretty risky we were really lucky to uh, already be talking to scotland the bread um, about this and without their help we wouldn't really have had the confidence or the access to the to the the information the knowledge um and also the markets so we started off with a slightly over ambitious uh entry into this growing 10 different varieties in the first year um, and immediately found that we were struggling with the first the first issue we hit was um going from a large uh, conventional arable farm producing, I don't know, 4,000 tonnes of grain a year to trying to produce small quantities and handle them separately and get them in a condition ready for a mill. Um, and I put all of this learning down to research and development. Uh, we need to learn how to do it so we can take a bit of pain for a few years um, to learn how to do it. But the whole process has been... Um, a, a real learning curve for us and learning how people used to farm actually the the modern conventional farming system was very unintelligent and you know it was just a sort of formula that you applied every year and got a result that was near enough the same this is a system which requires some real thought and uh and knowledge of your soils um we're still a long way from perfecting it but the journey's been a lot of fun and has got a lot of um, potential for us, partly because the system we operate now is leaning not just to, down the, the organic um, production route, but also the regenerative farming route. So we're looking for things that actually improve soils and learning some of the techniques of mixing varieties, um, uh, sowing you know spring milling wheats, winter milling wheats, rye, just the 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 process of growing those multiple crops in different formats has really led us to understand more about our soils and more about what we can do uh, to improve those soils. So we we set about with our ambitious ten crop or ten variety uh, trial. Um, we've reduced that now to about four varieties, which is which is easier to handle. Um, it gives us a benefit of scale to an extent, and it enables us to store and handle those crops uh, more efficiently. Um, but the biggest challenge for us, I think, is probably the, the downsizing what we did and learning that actually we spent 50 years scaling up to downsize is quite difficult. So small varieties or small crops, small quantities and storage and drying, et cetera, are very different for these. We have to treat them almost like a different crop. Um, in terms of the actual uh, production of local grains for a local baker, I'm absolutely convinced it's the, it, it really is much more enjoyable to produce, but actually it is the answer to, uh, to the food system but what we need to learn is what uh, infrastructure we need to have and what can be shared um, what others can use uh, and things like um, we had a we, we've got a grain dryer here for, for drying grain at harvest time which is at a scale which was suited to our old system but it used fossil fuels to uh, heat the air that ran over the grains and of course, that in itself is absolutely mental to be doing that and having fossil fuel fumes mixed with your milling grains. So we actually use a neighbor uh, with a biomass uh, heating uh, system to dry our grains for us. 
and we're in the process of trying to convert ours into a system which doesn't use fossil fuels directly over the grains. And these are things we never even thought about before because we just did what we always did. And so all the way down through the production system, we're realizing what, what doesn't make sense, what is long-term no, no longer relevant uh, in food production. Um, and it's, it, it takes a bit of getting your head around. It's given us uh, quite a few headaches and challenges. Um, things like these varieties that were bred in the, um, in the early 1800s that are, were designed to be cut by hand and stooped in a field and left to ripen. We're now trying to cut on one day with a machine that's designed to cut a, a monocrop, really, a monoculture. Uh, and so that, again, we have to learn how to handle it, when to do it. Um, but ultimately, Scott and the Bread have been a really good partner in this because of the level of um, analysis and data they can give us back in terms of quality and um, understanding that you know the, the modern quality criteria for growing milling wheat is very simple, you know, high Hagberg and uh, high protein. But actually, with the, with Scott and the Bread's uh, approach to this, we can we can cope with a few uh, googlies thrown at us by climate or uh, my inability to grow a consistent crop. Uh, and we understand what effect that has on the on the finished product, which up until that point it would have been a very simple sort of rejection and back into the feed pile for chickens. So this has been a really useful partnership to have somebody that can give you end user feedback. And we can do the same in return by saying, OK, well, th this was a, a lovely idea, but actually it's not going to work for these reasons. You've got to have that open uh, dialogue. And it certainly, from our perspective, without that, I think we probably would have experimented in year one and then gone back to convention in year two, or certainly gone back to commodity production. Uh, we're persevering with this, and the, the next phase for us is actually um, investing in processing equipment, because if we're going to do this properly, we need to be able to uh, to dry and clean and bag grains for mills um, and those mills don't want to take it in 30 ton lorry loads they want to take it in a half ton bag if you're lucky and probably a, a 16 kilo bag on the whole so we need to be able to get ourselves to a position where we can handle that kind of um, processing and all along the line we need to be able to work out how we can extract value out of it and the the value it becomes very difficult we're sitting in a position at the minute where world markets for grains and commodities are the highest they've ever been so what is the value is it a multiple of the the conventional market or is it completely irrelevant is is really the important thing for us is making sure this is long-term financially sustainable by making sure that we can cover all of our costs uh, and Im improve our margin over time we reckon it's probably costing about three times the amount to grow these crops per ton than uh, a conventional chemical uh, and synthetic uh, crop. So the question is, at what point do the customers value that three times the value? And you know, we're quite happy to be very open about how we build up those costs. And one of the things that we're looking at is um, economic nutrition. So we work out what element, what percentage of each uh, or percentage of the total cost, if you like, goes on labour, machinery, yeah, all the all the usual costs, so that we can actually demonstrate openly what it's costing. Um, and I think that we have a platform there to do that through partnerships, which we wouldn't do if we were just selling to a merchant, because actually you lose through a merchant, you lose that transparency uh, that's quite often used by somebody else for their marketing. So from the economic side, we really want to uh, measure and monitor what it's doing to soils. We know, we know from feeling it, smelling it, digging it, sniffing it, working it, that it's definitely improving the soils because of the diversity of crops that we're planting. We know that there's an awful lot of work to do finding out how we quantify that. And also how we then, um, 
match the growing and the product the production of these crops with our regenerative farming uh, principles which are things like minimizing disturbance of soil and right now in order to capture the quality we need we're we're planting these crops after grass we're having to still plow I'm, I'm quite interested to see on the in the other chat room there's a permanent cover green no-till um uh, conference going on I might tune into their video later. Um, but these things are possible with the help of other, um, I suppose it's a community of people who can offer help. We've accessed help through the James Hutton Institute on trialing different uh, permanent cover crops. None of these things would have been possible if other people weren't interested in what, uh, what we're doing and what Scott and the Bread are doing and how to change a food system. And what I've learned is that there, it doesn't matter how many people in the room, the more the merrier. Uh, whereas up until then, we had probably two of us, which was the agronomist and me. Uh, the agronomist had the upper hand all the way. And now I think we have a much more even spread of uh, knowledge and benefit across the board. Um, so other than that, I don't really have an awful lot that I can add to this. I'm just interested in... Uh, Fascinated to hear what how other people are using using the Scott and the Bread principles. That's great. Thanks very much, Sam. Um, I think that's added a, a lot to the conversation. So, um, yeah, really quite a lot to think about, and and really important um, as you say, you know, bringing in all those different voices. You know, yourself as a farmer, um, it's really important to know the realities, the challenges involved in. Um, you know, in, in looking at the short supply chain and a more local green uh, chain as well. Um, and as you say, you know, it is all about that partnership. It's about the sharing the expertise and, and working together to, to secure a, a, you know, a market for the crop that you're putting in so much effort to grow. So I'll stop sharing there. And I'm going to pass over now to Philip. So um, I was just going to say that, you know, as Sam sort of pointed out there's that that sort of smaller scale infrastructure which is a really important um, aspect and kind of a, a barrier to a lot of local grain production a lot of small scale grain production um, and as I mentioned that's something that we try and provide to the sort of soil to slice groups so that they have that opportunity to take part in uh, the whole process of growing grains and and then learning to bake with them as well so as I say I'll pass over to Philip now who's going to share a bit about why they got involved in, in the Soil Society's project and how that's helping people in his community think slightly differently about their, their daily loaf. Thank you very much, uh, Lindsay. Is that, are you able to see that? Um, so yeah, I, I'm gonna talk about our so-called patchwork wheat farm. Um, uh, I mean, Sam was talking about small scale, we're, we're many orders of magnitude smaller than what Sam was talking about. Um, but I just want to start off with a bit of background about the, the, the context that I'm coming from. Uh, I live in Dunbar, which is uh, across the Firth of Forth from Balkaski, on the, just about 30 miles east of Edinburgh, at the east end of East Lothian. Uh, Dunbar is a small town with, with a, a rural hinterland um, and I'm part of a community group called Sustaining Dunbar uh, which um, is all about trying to support our community to transition away from fossil fuel dependence and build local resilience to be able to face up to the climate and nature emergency. Um, we're structured as a community development trust uh, and we're also part of the, the global transition network. Um, we first set up actually about 12, 12, 13 years ago now. Um, and one of our first projects was a mass two year community engagement exercise and community mapping project to try and build a shared vision for the sort of future community uh, we wanted to uh, create um, after we had drastically reduced our dependence on fossil fuels. Um, and the outcome of this was what we called our local resilience action plan. 
uh, which um, was trying to hold up a vision for a much more uh, localized economy uh, in which we we're able to meet many more of our local needs from local resources. Um, and in terms of food, um, we, we found that actually most people were very keen to firstly have more opportunities for growing their own food, but, but secondly actually to be able to access local food and to really connect with local food growers and, and where their food came from than they're able to at the moment. Uh, and we created a vision of um, what we would like our local food economy to look like, where, where it's basically based on small scale mixed farming with, with much more local processing and consumption. And just out of interest, we, we, we sort of estimated how much land we would need in order to feed the local population based actually on uh, Simon Fairley's um, livestock permaculture model that he puts forward in his paper, Can Britain Feed Itself? Uh, and th this showed that um, we would need this much land in order to grow all our local food requirements. So that was quite encouraging that we, we did actually have plenty of land um, to spare to grow food for Edinburgh and elsewhere as well. Um, so, however, it, it's fair to say that we're a long way from achieving our uh, our vision um, 10 years down the line. And we, we always knew that um, transforming the food system was going to be a particularly difficult challenge. Um, Dunbar and, uh, is surrounded by some of the most fertile agricultural land in Scotland uh, and is dominated by large scale industrial monoculture farming. Uh, and the land is owned by a handful of families. Uh, and local farmers are basically tied into growing commodities. Um, there's a huge amount of barley and wheat grown, but almost all of it goes by either for um, whiskey, uh, biofuels, animal feed, or biscuit flour. Uh, so with, with a few minor exceptions, there's an almost complete disconnect between local farmers and um, local citizens. Um, there is also, I think, an increasing problem of loss of biodiversity and, and loss of soil structure. And, and this is a very common site uh, after heavy rain. It is lots of soil erosion. Um, so, uh, as I say, we, we, we haven't even attempted really to confront the existing food system head on, but we, we have started a number of small scale food projects and I guess our approach is to try and find a few niches where, where we can start to um, support an, an alternative system and different approach to take root. One of our very first projects actually was setting up a community bakery on Dunbar High Street which opened back in 2011 after uh, a couple of years of hard work and that's now owned by over a thousand local people. Um, this was actually as much to do with supporting the local economy and trying to revive the high street as it was about trying to give local people access to more nutritious food. Uh, it was actually then that I first met uh, Andrew Whitley, who, who gave us quite a lot of support uh, at the early stages of setting up the community bakery. And that, that's really where my links with Andrew and with Scotland the Bread first um, developed. Um, we also set up a community garden, uh, a two acre garden and community orchard in the grounds of our local cottage hospital. Uh, again, this is about much more than growing food. It's also about um, setting up a, a therapeutic space for, for the community and a space for patients and staff uh, to come uh, and a place where people can learn and share new skills to, together. Um, so more, more recently, we've been revisiting our and revising our vision uh, and particularly during COVID, we, we've used this as an opportunity to really establish or rebuild, refresh relationships with other groups across the community. Uh, and one thing that's come out of that 
project. Um, uh, so asking what sort of community you want to recover to after COVID is the creation of what we call the Local Good Food Alliance, which is bringing together a, a, a about or more than 30 different groups across the community who are involved in some way with food. So that includes groups who are very much at the front line of supporting people at risk of food poverty, but also people who, who are working to um, envision a different local food economy. Um, so this, for example, is a group that works with uh, what food that would have gone to waste to, to make um, soups and other dishes, which, which then are distributed, to, for example, through the community fridge and community freezer project. Uh, a key member of the Food Alliance is the Crunchy Carrot, which is a long-standing um, sort of anchor shop on, on the high street, which does a huge amount to support and, and um, try and make available local food. Uh, and that's now too recently been brought into community ownership. Um, so um, th this is me in our community garden with, with our first um, plot of wheat, which I think was back in 2019. Um, just to explain a bit more background, I mean, that was rather a long preamble, but um, just to extend it further, um, my interest in this in part goes back to the time in the 1980s when I was working in Zimbabwe, just after independence, working with peasant farmers there. Uh, and I became aware that how peasant farmers in Zimbabwe at that time were really being pressured into growing hybrid um, maize in particular, which depended on fertilizer inputs. They weren't able to save seed for sowing the next year. Uh, and successful crop very much depended on firstly being able to get the inputs, but secondly on the rains coming at the right time. Uh, and even then rains were becoming pretty erratic. Uh, so I got involved in, in a project to collect um, well, open pollinated varieties of uh, maize, but also more especially um, traditional crops such as sorghum and millet and finger millet uh, to collect those to then um, multiply and redistribute the, the seed to make a more, much more resilient um, system for local people. Uh, so that's just one of the multiplication plots. Anyway, uh, yeah, back in 2019, I, I managed to get uh, hold of some seed from the South Slice project, uh, which was uh, a range of different spring wheat varieties, heritage wheat varieties from Sweden. Uh, and actually in the first year, I was rather ambitiously grew 100 square meters. Um, which um, proved quite problematic actually preparing the, the ground by hand and then particularly when it came to harvesting it initially with a scythe which I failed miserably to master uh, and then with a, a sickle but uh, um, I, I was very pleased with how the crop looked and I, I did get a fair bit of interest from other people uh, involved with the community garden um, processing it was um, a bit of a challenge. Um, I, I was, didn't want to take a small amount of wheat all the way around to Fife to make use of the, uh, the, the threshing machine um, in Scotland, the bread's threshing machine. So I ended up getting that, our local men's shed to make me a flail, um, which actually worked surprisingly well, but it was actually quite hard work. Uh, and then of course uh, it had to be winnowed, um, but it really does, um, really enhance one's uh, the, the, the sense of um, pride and value one has in every grain of wheat which one does extract through this method. Um, anyway, in, in the second year I managed to get a few more people involved uh, and then last year, um, well the, the second year that, that worked quite well, I got about half a dozen um, other people involved growing small patches. Uh, unfortunately, because of COVID, we weren't actually able to get together and there was limited sort of engagement and sharing between the group. That this year is much more successful. I, I ended up getting 15 uh, local families uh, agreeing to grow anything up from a, a, a square meter upwards in their garden. Uh, and that I was very pleased in particular to get one of the doctors at the medical center grew a patch of wheat. Uh, and three of the local primary schools became involved uh, as well. Uh, and I managed to get much more peer-to-peer -peer interaction. Um, people got me very excited as their crops germinated and grew. Uh, there was lots of sharing of photographs and people learned a huge amount um, 
uh, more about, well, just how wheat grows uh, and what is involved. Uh, and then just recently in September, I was able to borrow some small scale equipment from Scotland the Bread. Uh, so we got together for a threshing and processing party. Uh, before then, we, we uh, each selected some of the, the best looking heads uh, with, with the plumpest ears for saving to seed for growing on next year. Uh, and then we um, threshed the wheat in this mini um, combine harvester, uh, which is still a pretty slow process, but we got through the whole crop in an hour or two. Uh, and then we also had the Scotland the Bread's uh, seed cleaning machine, which again saved a huge amount of effort with winnowing uh, the crop and ending up with some grain that was clean enough to then put through uh, a very small hand mill. Um, so we have now milled most of the, uh, the crop into flour uh, and we've even baked some bread. Um, that's not 100% um, uh, our own wheat, but it's about 50%. Um, so in terms of where the project goes next, um, I, I still not sure to be honest, I think next year I'll just be looking to expand the number of growers involved. Um, I, I'm still holding this um, vision of developing a local land race and, and securing enough land locally to grow enough heritage wheat uh, to um, be able to process it locally to supply local bakeries and others to use um, flour locally. But how that will happen, I have no idea at the moment. Um, but certainly there's a lot more people now uh, very much more engaged with, with the whole process of growing wheat and understanding what is involved in processing it into flour and bread. So uh, it's very small, but I, I feel it's been very successful so far. I think that's probably enough for me so far. If you want to get in touch with me, those are my contact details. And I will attempt to stop screen sharing. Great. Thanks very much, Philip. It's, um, it's good to hear that the flailing experience hasn't put you off continuing year on year and that your community is really growing. Um, and I, I really enjoyed seeing the photos as well of lots of people um, kind of getting involved in the seed selection um, and, you know, the whole process as well. But I think especially, um, you know, for your ambitions to sort of have a, a local land race that's really um, developed by the local people, that's that's a really key um aspect of the process as well and it's it's one that tara is going to kind of talk about a li little bit more now um you know to do with the research that you carried out with scotland the bread and nurse scotland um and also just a little bit more about your own research your own background so um, i'll pass over to tara just now Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk a bit about participatory approaches to crop science and sort of how, yeah, basically how to make crop science not this top down thing that's done far away in a laboratory um, and controlled by big companies, basically. So how we can we can involve people in crop science and how this links in with community grain. Um, so I'm going to start with it, just a very brief history of wheat. Um, so bread wheat, in a si similar form to what we have now, first emerged over 10,000 years ago in the Fertile Crescent in the Middle East. Um, so it's really one of our oldest grains. Um, it emerged from the hybridization of emmer, which is a hulled wheat, um, sort of an older version, and, the, and a wild grass. And by the 7th millennium BC, so this is within a thousand years of, of this of wheat, wheat bread wheat emerging, it's already spreading all the way across Europe. So it was clearly a success right from the beginning. Um, and this picture in the bottom left is one I took, I was in, when I was in Greece, I just found it in, in a museum um, of a Mycenaean girl, 3,500 years ago, holding bunches of wheat. And for, for millennia, 
um, for most of this 10,000 years, we has been cultivated as land races. So a land race is a locally adapted, genetically diverse variety, um, which over time grown with traditional methods would be selected by farmers on their fields um, and would adapt to the local climate, um, would change slowly over time according to the preferences of local people. And there have been, because of the, this way of selecting grains, there would have been thousands of varieties grown across the world, of different varieties of wheat. It's not until the mid 18th century that we start to see the first sort of scientific selection of wheat um, to develop known varieties. Um, and at this point, we, we start to see plant, people who are interested in, in plant breeding making, yeah, making selections of higher yielding um, plants and things like that to develop, develop varieties that have specific traits. Um, with the selection, we do see a, a decrease in genetic diversity because there's just selecting for certain specific traits. Um, so yeah, such as yield. So we do start to see less diversity, but we also see a, quite a big increase in the amount that people are able to produce on, on an amount of land. And when we talk about heritage wheats now and the wheats that were growing in, grown by Scotland, the bread, um, for example, most of what we're talking about would be these kind of wheats selected from the mid 18th century on, onwards. So that we're about maybe 200 years old. Um, I think some of the, the Scotland the bread ones are recorded in the 19th century. Um, so they're still quite diverse, but they have had this degree of selection um, to imp improve the varieties. And then in the early 20th century, we start to see the first intentional crossing of different varieties of wheat to get specific traits, so to combine specific traits. Crossing wheat, wheat doesn't really outcross very easily in the field. So to actually get it to, to cross, kind of requires um, tweezers and a magnifying glass and quite a lot of effort. Um, so this, this sort of began at, at scale as a way of producing varieties in the 20th century. And in 1916, the first sort of intentionally crossed major variety started being grown in the UK. This combined high protein variety from Canada with varieties that are adapted to the UK climate and combine them to create a high protein wheat that could be grown across the UK. This is a sort of, yeah, modern wheat breeding. Um, and since then we've, we've seen a, re, yeah, a real increase in, in conventional breeding. And in the 20th century, to, yeah, towards the second half of the 20th century, we have what's known as the Green Revolution, which sounds really great and radical and like, what everybody wants to happen but has quite has had quite a lot of knock-on negative effects um throughout the 20th century we see an increase in the use of chemical inputs like for, such as fertilizer and if you put fertilizer on wheat plants you see um, a huge increase in growth so you end up with much taller plants and the older varieties of wheat i'll show you in the next slide are already much taller yeah are, are well they're, yeah they're, they were taller than the varieties we have now when you get tall plants, they're more likely to lodge. The lodging is, fall, is basically when plants fall over, and this leads to a de decrease in yield and a decrease in the quality of the grain. And it's more likely when you have severe weather. So for example, if there was heavy wind or rain, lodging is more likely to happen. In order to cope with this problem of lodging when you're using chemical inputs, selective breeding was used to develop semi-dwarf varieties, which are considerably shorter than the heritage varieties that were grown before. Now, most of the wheat that's grown around the world are these semi-dwarf varieties. And if you see wheat in a field, if you imagine what it looks like, that's a, that's a semi-dwarf, most likely to be a semi-dwarf variety and not, not similar in height to the, the previous the grown varieties. These did lead to real increases in yields, particularly in areas that are sort of like prime wheat growing areas. Um, there, yeah, huge increases in yield across Europe, Asia and South America. But along with these increases in yields, we start to see a real a disappearance of other varieties. Because these varieties are much higher yielding, these, they rapidly take over because of the sort of market, the way the market is, they rapidly took over as the main wheats that are grown. And now 
there are only 3% of the wheat growing land in the world is used to grow land races. Pretty much everything else is used to grow higher yielding varieties. Another sort of side effect of the semi-dwarf phenotype is that the, short, the shorter plants aren't able to compete with weeds. Um, when you grow older varieties of wheat, they grow very quite pretty fast and vigorously, and they grow very tall. So they outcompete the weeds around about them. And I've noticed this when I've been growing things in the field. I sort of imagined I'd have to do a bunch of weeding, but this hasn't happened at all. The plants just get themselves going and overtake everything else. But that doesn't happen with the semi-dwarf varieties because they're so much shorter. So then we then have seen an increase in dependence on herbicide use for growing modern varieties. So we have these modern varieties which are shorter um, and basically designed to grow with quite a lot of chemical inputs in areas that are really good wheat, wheat growing areas. And in these areas, conventional breeding has been really successful. But in the process, um, and not just in terms of wheat, but just in terms of crops generally, we've lost 75% of crop biodiversity. And in terms of what's actually grown in farmers' fields, we've lost 90%. So a lot of the rest of it is just kind of kept on research stations and not grown in the field. field. Um, these, these varieties that are conventionally bred, are they're bred on research stations. Um, so scientists are making these decisions and selecting for specific traits. And it, yeah, in this process, we've lost a lot of genetic diversity. Um, just briefly, in terms of why the genetic diversity is important, um, if you have a diverse, basically, if you have a diverse population and there's some kind of environmental pressure, for example, um, there's drought one year or there's a particular new type of pest arrives, it's likely that some of your wheat is going to succumb to that. But some of it, because you've got this genetic diversity, some of it will be more resilient and the more resilient ones will continue. And over time, you'll have selection for more resilience. Um, and when we use have these modern varieties, which are a complete monocrop, they're totally genetically homogenous. We lose the ability to adapt. So those, those varieties will never adapt themselves to the pressures of the environment. But at the same time, the pest species, the diseases, the funguses, fungal species, they are all still genetically diverse. So they're still able to adapt very quickly to anything that the, any changes in the wheat. So if scientists develop a variety which is resistant to a particular type of disease, that disease is still able to adapt to that resistance and overcome it over time. Whereas that wheat hasn't, hasn't got that ability. Um, I think this is important to remember as well, to point out in the, um, when talking about climate change, um, partly because a, a more diverse crop is going to be more resilient to variable weather and unpredictable weather, but also that there's a lot of work going into in the sort of scientific community going into selecting using conventional breeding and genetically modifying organisms as well. And um, there's quite a lot of work going into to selecting for specific resilience traits. So, for example, selecting for varieties that have a gene for drought resistance. Um, and while this will effectively increase the drought resistance of the varieties, it, it also reduces genetic diversity further um, and, yeah, creates some of the same problems that we've seen from previous conventional breeding. Um, so this kind of narrow minded approach to, to selecting for just one trait in um, homogenous populations potentially needs to be rethought. I think, yeah, also the importance of genetic diversity within one field. So not just growing lots of different varieties, but growing varieties that themselves are genetically, genetically diverse is actually still quite controversial in the scientific field. Although when I've spoken to farmers, growing, for example, populations of grain is becoming really quite widespread. So I think it's one of these areas where the farming community is really a long way ahead of the scientific community. Um, on the right is just a picture of some, some grains um, I think this is from the Balkaski land race, um, just to show the difference between these just, just three random spikes of grain I found in the field. Uh, this was just to show a little bit the difference between modern wheat and heritage wheat. 
Um, I've just realized that Sam is watching this presentation, so now he's going to see pictures of me standing in the middle of his fields. Um, but, but this, yeah, this is just to illustrate the difference. You see the modern wheat is very homogenous and very short, and the heritage wheat is much taller and quite obviously diverse to look. Um, so then I've, while I was working for Scotland the Bread and Nourish last summer, I started looking into other, uh, different approaches to plant breeding, um, which are more inclusive. And I have, yeah, did some research into participatory plant breeding. So this is a collaborative approach to, to selecting grains or any type of crop um, where farmers grow the grow the crop in their fields and they're involved in making the selections. So rather than this happening somewhere separate on a research station far away and then the seed being kind of given to farmers as this is what you grow now, the farmers are involved in the whole process. This has mostly been employed in areas where convention, conventional breeding hasn't been successful. And it's primarily being tried in the, glo in the global south. So often in areas where subsistence farming is the main form of farming, um, but also in areas where the, it's sort of marginal wheat growing land, where the conventional varieties just actually don't grow very well. And I think it's worth noting that Scotland is, is considered marginal land for growing bread wheat. Um, the Scottish government has a thing on their website that says you can't grow bread wheat here, although we obviously know that's not true. Um, but despite the fact that there, yeah, Scotland is considered marginal land and the convent, there aren't any conventional varieties bred to grow in this climate, we haven't really seen this sort of participatory approach used very much here. Um, it's yeah, all, almost all the examples come from the global south. And this photograph is taken from some research I did in Ethiopia, working with teff farmers. Teff is a grain that's native to Ethiopia. And there, pretty much all of agricultural research is considerably more participatory and farmers are involved in the process throughout, be it whether it's plant breeding or looking at new crop management techniques, and um, they have a much more participatory approach. This approach doesn't lead to losses in genetic diversity um, because you're not, yeah, you're not selecting just for very specific traits or based on the genetics of the plants. And it also leads to locally adapted variety development because farmers in one area will select for certain varieties while farmers in another area might select for others. Farmers tend to make selections that are quite different from those that are made by the scientists. Scientists tend to focus on, usually on yield, basically, um, and occasionally on particular resistance traits. But when farmers have been asked to do the selections themselves, then they tend to focus on things like flavor, um, which is obviously very important when we're growing a food, um, or cultural preference. So for example, for the color of the grains, um, um, yeah, what, what fits best into the local cuisine. There's also quite a lot of wider benefits of this participatory approach. There's some good evidence from projects around the world that it's, it's more empowering for, for small scale farmers and particularly for women farmers to have this control over their own crops and be able to make their own decisions. Um, it strengthens communities and builds up um, seed sharing networks and things like that, which reduces dependence on big agribusiness, which is really useful for smaller scale farmers. One of the notable things about participatory plant breeding is that it's mostly been done in areas where um, the, yeah, the main agricultural system is subsistence farming. So the farmers are also the same, the same people grow the, the grain as mill it, bake it and eat it. Um, so those, the, the, the consumer essentially is involved in the whole process in selecting the grain. And here in the, in the West, we have um, really a lot, a lot of disconnect between the people who eat the food and the people who grow the food and from the grain itself. So not only do we have disconnect between farmers and their, their crops, they're not making any of the selections themselves, but we also have disconnect between the people who are eating it and the farms. Um, so Skull and the Bread has run these people's plant breeding events um, to try and involve more stakeholders, uh, more people who are involved in the grain system in the process of selecting grains. It's not a terribly scientific process, um, but it's a really good way of 
learning from from these different people so not we have have growers who can talk about but that that side of it who are experts in in what the wheat should look like on the plant millers who are looking for particularly different things um in terms of the yeah the milling quality of the grain bakers who are interested in flavor and the and things like that so it's really interesting to learn from each other's perspectives and it builds community along the grain system and reconnects people with their with their staple crops so there's been a few of these events in person and a few online that I've helped out with. Um, select, selecting grains based on, yeah, sometimes on people, whether people think they're beautiful or whether they're, they look like they're going to have interesting coloured grains or whether a baker thinks that the, the baking quality um, looks good. So, yeah, th these are a potential way of encouraging a whole community to be involved in the local grain system. Um, just very quickly, because I think I'm running over time. Um, I've also been helping out in terms of um, including people in grain, in grain growing. And um, I've also been helping out with the citizen science aspect of the Soil to Slice project. Um, helping, so putting together some protocols and things for participants to be able to collect and analyze the data. So measuring how their plants grow. And this is really important for building up a picture of how different environments and cultivation methods can affect small scale cereal growing in Scotland. So if you see on this map, those are all the different places where we have soil to slice projects and um, where people are growing heritage growing grains at small scale. And everyone has different conditions, different experiences with weather um, and is trying different methods. So it's really important to gather the data on how this goes and that can feed into Scotland the Bread's research. Um, and it's also interesting to analyze how wheat populations change over time. Um, and we can do that by doing some of these measurements each year. So yeah, this is my kind of vision for Scotland is um, using a more collaborative approach to grain, both at a kind of larger scale farm level in terms of including farmers in, in grain research um, and also involving communities to strengthen local supply chains, build communities around food production, and reduce our reliance on commodity farming in Scotland. Thank you. I realised everyone else put their contact details and I didn't, so I'll put mine in the chat. Thanks very much, Tara. And um, yeah, just to say as well, thanks so much to Tara for all of her help with, um, with developing a lot of the measurements and things for the citizen science um, part of this soil to slice project. And yeah, and, and for all our expertise that she's been able to provide on selecting seed, we actually had an event last week at the COP26 conference in the um, Nourish Scotland space. And we had a little bundle of wheat, a um, little bit like this, on each of the tables and the participants were able to select from that, um, you know, in that real time. And we're hoping to sort of find a little part of the trial plot, which um, we'll be speaking to you later about Sam, um, for us just to grow on that little COP26 selected um, plot of green. So we'll see how that one goes as well. Um, but yeah, really, uh, interesting I think to hear about Tara's um, you know Tara's research and that way of bringing in so many diverse voices into a, a sort of local grain production um, and obviously that plays a large part in the research that Daisy's um, participating in and leading at the moment um, and really that's especially focusing on the experiences of farmers, millers, um, bakers and others sort of in that uh, grain chain and looking to develop a new metric really of um, measuring agricultural outputs and yields away from you know the yield of the the field itself so again sort of tying in a little bit about what Sam was saying earlier and um, looking at different ways of measuring what what is coming out and how that's nourishing nourishing the people nourishing the soil as well so I'll let Daisy explain it in a much more elegant way I'm not sure I can be any more eloquent than that, Lindsay. Thanks very much for that introduction. Um, I'm Daisy and I'm a research assistant in food systems at the University of Edinburgh. And also in the audience here, well, in the room, in the Zoom room, we've got Alfie Gaythorne Hardy and Lindsay Jacks, if you can give us a wave. Um, and they're, we're part of a team and we're all based at the Global Academy of Agriculture and Food Security at the University of Edinburgh. And as Lindsay said, um, we're working on a project which is a collaboration with Scotland the Bread and it's called RISE. 
and we the overall goal of the project is to evolve the way that we measure and evaluate agricultural production so as Tara said as well often and for a long time the decisions that that we make in our food system are often based primarily on yield on how many tons per hectare can we get from this land um, and sometimes without considering kind of the wider consequences of our decisions for um, for public health for societies for the environment and so together with Scotland the Bread and um, all of their expertise we're we're looking to develop new metrics to to evaluate not just the tons per hectare not just the yield that we can get from a piece of land but also the number of people that can be nourished per hectare and we're looking at nourishment in two different ways firstly through dietary nourishment so we've we've learned all about these these nutritious varieties of grain that that local people are developing um, but also through nourishment of jobs so creation and sort of sustaining jobs on the land in the field in the mill in the bakery so yeah so we're asking how many people can be nourished by these local grain flour bread supply chains um, and so i'm just going to share my screen now and i've got a couple of slides so i'll just make that larger there we go. So yeah, here's the title of our study, Rise, People and Jobs Nourished Per Hectare. Um, and in the first part of our research, so this, this graphic kind of shows you our, our overall methodology. In the first part of the research, we are analysing the nutrient composition of grain and flour and bread samples. And that's in order to calculate basically how, how many people can can be nourished by these products and by a certain area of land. But in this short session today, I'm going to focus on the other side of nourishment. So the jobs nourished per hectare. And in order to look at that in our in our research, we are reaching out to and talking with um, grain growers and flour millers and bread bakers. And we're asking them how much work is involved in producing grain and flour and bread and who's doing the work currently in these systems and also we're trying to understand what's the quality of that work like is the work good uh, what's good about the work what's not so good about the work and what does it feel like to do that work so we're asking what does a good job look like and that's a pretty complex question to answer actually um, so we know, we all know ourselves, how our jobs can have a really significant impact on our own personal well-being and um, they can be really stressful, they can be demanding, they can be tiring, or hopefully they, they can offer us a sense of security, um, a sense of purpose, they can offer opportunities for learning. I think we've seen a lot of that from the other presenters that have spoken before me today, um, how inspiring work can be. Um, and sense of yeah sense of enjoyment and purpose in life um but so characterizing what makes a job good or bad is really subjective because we all have different feelings and expectations around our work we all need different things from our work and we all care about different things um so it's really complex and so we thought it would be really interesting in this session to invite a little bit of audience participation and to turn this question over to you of what do you what do you feel makes a good job what's important um, in work what makes a job supportive and and good for the person that does that job and so in order to do that we've designed a very brief anonymous online survey which all of us will be able to find in um, in room two of the conference virtual portal. And I'm just going to, using my screen sharing, I'm gonna just demonstrate how to find that. And then when you're ready, you can, you can follow me to that, to that place. So I'm just gonna shop, stop sharing my slide for the moment. And if you minimize your Zoom 
screen. So there'll be a there'll be a button at the top of your Zoom screen, either on the left or the right, and you can click click minimize, and it will make it small. And behind your Zoom screen, you should have room two of the conference that we're all virtually gathered in, and you should find the citizen grain image of the people carrying sheaves of wheat in front of you. And just above that image, there's a tab um, that has been embedded and if you click on it it's called survey what does a job a good job look like and if you click on it like I'm doing now you will you'll see the survey questions and you'll see these fields where you're invited to input your responses and so if you feel inspired to come along with me now I'll talk us through the questions and we'll take a few minutes for each one just to consider them for ourselves and to note down our reflections and when we're done putting our reflections into these fields, when we click finish, our research team will receive your responses, but it will be completely anonymous. So we won't receive your name or your email address or any identifying information about you. If you prefer not to do this online in this way, feel free to grab a bit of paper and a pen and just use this as a reflective exercise for yourself um, at home, thinking about, thinking about your experiences of work. So, if everybody could navigate to room two now and click on this tab. And by minimizing your Zoom screen, you'll still be able to hear me. You'll still be part of the call, but you'll just see, see this page in front of you. And the first question I'd like to invite us to consider um, is about good experience that we've had in our working life. So thinking back maybe to our current job or previous jobs we've had in the past, reflecting on really good experiences we've had at work. They might be great experiences. Um, and reflecting on what elements of that job made that experience feel so positive. So what, what aspects of jobs can make them feel really good? And so I'm gonna give us just a couple of minutes of silence now to consider that question. And if you feel drawn to input your response into the box there underneath question one. So I'll go quiet for a couple of minutes. And then when you're ready, bringing your reflections on question one to a close. And then moving down to question two, just because we're limited for time. If you want to come back to this survey later um, and fill it out in more detail, you're really welcome. But, but for now, just quick reflections are really welcome. So thinking about maybe difficult or bad experiences that you've had at work in your current job or in a previous job and considering what aspects of the job resulted in those bad experiences. And noting, noting down what comes to mind.
And then finally, the third question, just reflecting on maybe your answers to questions one and two might inform how you feel about this. But in your opinion, what come to mind is the most is the three most important aspects of a good job? So that will be different for all of us, hopefully. But it will be really interesting to see whether there's any consensus amongst us and our different experiences. What are the three most important aspects of a good quality job? And when you feel like you've finished answering that question, you can either click this finish button at the bottom to submit your answers to us, um, and we'll be delighted to read them. Or you can wait to click finish later if you want to come back and put any more detail in if, if you're feeling inspired to do that. Um, and I'm really grateful to you guys for jumping on board and coming with me to do this survey. Once, once we've had a look through everybody's anonymized answers will put together a sort of brief summary of what of the themes that have come up of what people have said um, and if you would like to receive that to have a look at it um, for your rest uh, there's another tab here um, next next to the tab that you clicked on to find the survey just to the right of it there's a tab to, that says submit your contact details so if you'd like us to have your email address and we can pass on that that report um, of our results of our little bit of science just now, then please input your input your email address there and we'll have that. Um, I'm just going to navigate back now to a final slide before we wrap up. So I just wanted to show you, we did this similar exercise um, at Scotland the Bread's um, Nourish COP26 event. Oops, I'm back to the beginning. I'll just zoom through last week. Um, and these are the, some of the themes that came up for people thinking about what were the most important aspects of good quality jobs. So it'd be interesting to see if any of your, um, your feelings are reflected here. Just give you a moment to kind of scan through. There's lots of information on this slide, but we've got kind of themes around flexibility, sense of sort of personal autonomy and self-determination in work. Um, friendships, relationships seem really important among, between colleagues and also good Good relationships with managers and 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 wider teams. Um, pay came up a lot less than we thought it would, but it but it was present. It was important to people, and of course it is. Um, and what seemed very very important to people was a sort of sense of pride in what they do, a sense of purpose, a sense of achievement at the end of the day. Um, yeah, so those are some of the themes that are coming up so far, and yeah, we look forward to. Um, to enriching what we already know with, with some of what you shared with us this evening. So thank you so much to everybody. And as I said, we are currently looking to talk to bakers and millers and growers to, um, to find out more about their feelings about their work. So if you are one of those and you would like to participate in our study further, you can also email me at this email address. You can also put your, put your email address in that, in that tab in room two. I'll stop there because I've run over time as well. Thank you, everybody, um, for, for doing that with us this evening. And I will stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Daisy. Over to Lindsay. Thank you. Um, and yeah, and thanks to everyone who's participating because that's, um, yeah, another great way of like getting directly involved in, in some research, which is really going to make a massive difference and, um, and create something new and a really exciting 
new metric which will help the local local supply chains in general and um, particularly for green at this moment um so we've got about 10 minutes left i think for questions um there's a few already in the chat so i'll just start with those ones first um we have one for sam first of all uh, from gibson community farm in gateshead asking what sort of quantities were you handling um if you'd like to unmute yourself um and elaborate on that then do feel free to do so hello hello yeah i was just um I, it was, it's interesting for me as somebody who's tried to grow grains on a small scale um what, when you talked about small scale in in the end what what um volumes were you actually talking about um well i think we we established with the work we're doing there's um a micro scale, a small scale, a medium scale, and a large scale. And um, we're probably still in the small, aiming for medium. And when I talk about that, we're probably looking at 50 ton batches of anything. Um, we're probably growing about 200, 250 tons a year or so um, of uh, crops for Scotland the bread. Uh, and then uh, yeah, on top of that, other other grains as well. Um, but we know that there's a there's there's a real shortage of equipment to enable processing at anything below five tons large scale. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes it's easier to get a sort of hand mill or a hand uh, thresher than it is to get a a thresher that will do you know twenty tons. Um, and that's that's where we're finding the difficulty. But in terms of small scale and ability to share and utilize, I sort of look back to the days when uh, flour mills were dotted all over the countryside, and actually they were the facilities that the local farmers took their grain to. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, it didn't matter whether it was one sack or whether it was you know two hundred tons; they all went somewhere. Uh, we've lost that, and we if we grow uh, cereals now, we either grow them uh, at a large scale with no processing at all and send them on to somebody else for processing, or we grow them at a small scale and try and fit the bill as best we can with some fairly Heath Robinson equipment. Um, and when we add in Heath Robinson equipment, we add in a lot of cost because it's, it's time and it's energy, it's people's energy that we've replaced it with. Uh, so we're at the, in the process of trying to put in place um, a better uh, cleaning system, better drying system, better polishing, bagging, but all of those things will be based on pro probably a, a, a target of 50 to 100 tonne batches of each type of crop. Yeah, well out of my range. <laughs> well, I think uh, Scott and the Bread uh, and Andrew Whitley being the champion of community uh, participation is really pushing hard to put in what he's referring to as the five fermenter uh, on one of our units, which would enable the micro scale uh, to share facilities uh, and be able to replicate that around the countryside. Yeah, um, I think, yeah, just to sort of speak to that, um, you'd also asked you know, sort of the equipment that's on our list and if it is the sort of micro scale that you're looking at, what we're able to share, you'll have seen from Philip's slides, is a sort of very small mini bath thresher, um, which as he says, does still take quite a bit of work, um, a tabletop mill and a seed cleaner as well. So very much depending on the skill you're looking at, those that's what's, what's kind of available. Um, we were, it, growing, we were growing on about 1.2 hectares. Right, that's probably in between our scale and Sam's as well, and that's quite a tricky one to find. And certainly that's um, a theme that's come up, I think, in a lot of conferences, a lot of conversations is is getting the equipment that's right for that scale. I know that um, at the Seed Sovereignty Conference recently, there was a lot of talk of the um, that, you know, that intermediate um, infrastructure and equipment that, that people were trying to come up with and quite an interesting development of um an old dehuller as well so it seriously seems to be a, a common issue 
um, among many people. Uh, the next question, if that's if that's answered what you're asking. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the next question that came up was, what rotation are you looking at? I think again directed to Sam. Um, ultimately, where our fertility building is grass, um, our sort of main fertility build here is livestock. Uh, and then we will probably take um, a milling wheat from uh, after grass, and then we'll probably take a, a pulse or uh, uh, oats, um, and then either another oats, barley, or, or pulse, or and back to grass again. We're probably only looking at three straw crops or three cash crops, if you like, uh, between fertility building grasses at the minute. Thanks very much. Um, the next question that I can see in the chat was, uh, where is funding for the project coming from? Although um, I think has that been answered by Lynn's yeah. Amelia? Yeah, okay. Just trying to keep up with what's there, what's been written. Um, in that case, the next one is another question to Sam. Uh, have you explored intercropping wheat with any grain legumes, which? <laughs> yeah, you, uh, yes. I have. Um, perhaps you weren't party to our disastrous intercropping trial last year. <laughs> we we thought it would be a really good idea to grow vetches alongside the wheat uh, in order to try and increase the protein. Um, but it just makes harvesting and uh, separation so much harder. And we're already struggling. Trying to find one crop of a multi-variety um, establishment which ripens evenly which means you can harvest it when the quality is right is difficult enough but to add in another crop alongside that is even harder and we know if i'm really brutally honest we're harvesting crops at a moisture content probably five to eight ten percent even higher than we would do for a normal crop in order to capture the, the highest Hagbo and uh, protein levels we can, which then demands an enormous amount of energy to dry it artificially. And that doesn't feel right. So I'm not pushing the intercropping anymore. I'm sort of backing off it um, and looking at the whole production cycle, including energy used as well. Does that answer? enough yeah alfie has got his answer that's great um yeah that was an interesting experiment i remember seeing photos of the combine harvester going along with steam sort of coming at the back from all the moisture um but certainly an interesting one to have done i guess it carries on with the learning and development you mentioned i think that's so far the only questions i've seen in the chat i don't know if anyone has any that they want to come out with just now. Okay, if that's the case, then um, we can wrap up on time actually. Um, I've noticed as well, Harry's uh, mentioned in the chat that the plot com combine harvesters are quite, could be quite ideal. And there has been, um, I've seen a couple of messages about that recently about from uh, a group in Edinburgh who are looking to do a sort of urban farm project. So something definitely to look into and quite an interesting and very exciting project, I think, to be involved in um, and to see where that one goes. So definitely good to know. So I will just finish up there um, by saying, first of all, a massive thank you to all of our speakers, um, sharing all of their work and all of their research, everything that they're doing really to include all their, their different communities. Uh, whether that be farmers, uh, local people or scientists, um, millers, bakers and farmers in the case of Daisy, in, in our search really and our quest to, to create a better flour and bread system here in Scotland. And um, we do hope that this kind of inspires you elsewhere in Scotland or in the UK, Northern England, to, to see what's out there and perhaps to get involved yourself in, in that local grain system in your area. Um, Again, thank you so much to the Northern Real Farming Conference team for giving us this space and particularly to Melanie just now for helping out so much with all the keeping the chat in check and um, taking care of all the recordings and the tech stuff behind the scenes. It's been great to have you here and really appreciate your support. 
Um, and last but certainly not least, I'd like to thank everyone who's come here tonight um, to make time to, to listen to us and to share your thoughts and to share your questions as well. It's, it's great to see so many faces and we're really, yeah, really delighted to have had you with us here. So thank you to everyone and I'll say good night there.